there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. Back in 2006, my mom and I took a trip to Winterthur in Delaware, and the Flight 93 Memorial is on the way from Ohio to Delaware, so we decided we would stop. Kylie Bomley knew that visit to Shanksville, Pennsylvania would be a profound and moving experience, but she had no idea it would change her life. We got back in the car to go back home, and mom said, look what I found, and she found this beautiful, perfect monarch, it had died. And we looked at it and it had a sticker on it, a little white sticker about the size of a pencil eraser. And it had a website, a phone number, and an identification number. And we didn't know what that was about, so when I got home, I looked it up. And here it was, a butterfly that had been tagged through the University of Kansas and Monarch Watch, their program where they track the migration of the monarch butterflies to Mexico. So that's what got me started. I was fascinated. I learned the story of the migration, the metamorphosis, all the steps, everything that has to happen to, to complete the whole life cycle, and I was just fascinated by it, and I have been ever since. We know that the monarch is in peril. They've declined by 90%. The population of the eastern part of the U.S., east of the Rockies, has declined by 90%. And we are collectively, as a nation, trying to do something to, to reverse that. You know, they're, they're very iconic. Everybody recognizes them. They're the most recognized butterfly in North America. And I don't want to see them go away. There's a very real chance of that happening. Ask any gardener these days what's on their short list of upcoming projects, and there's a good chance they'll say a butterfly or pollinator garden. That's because the loss of so many native habitats has decimated many of the plants these insects need to survive. But as gardeners often do, they're rising up now in force in their efforts to restore lost pollinator habitats across the country, often starting in their own backyards. In today's episode, we work with some of the nation's top experts and citizen scientists like Kylie, who share surprisingly simple ways to help us restore the populations of these threatened insects in gardens of any size. It's easier than you think. Not only can we beautify our own landscapes with native plants, but we can give monarchs and other butterfly species and pollinators a fighting chance. We all like to see butterflies flitting around our garden, but why are they important? For one thing, they are pollinators. They're not as efficient as our bees and some of our wasps, but they do pollinate, which is important because it helps produce the next generation of plants with, through the seeds. But they're also prey for a whole host of other insects and birds and small mammals. Honeybees get all the buzz right now and their fight for survival is a real concern. 
Many people may not realize that butterflies also occupy a critical slot in our planetary ecosystem and the global food chain in particular. Whether they're helping to pollinate the edible crops that we depend on for food or acting as the food source for other animals who have their own role to play, butterflies are much more than just pretty faces in the gardens of the world and their decline could have far-reaching implications. While most of us are just becoming aware of the danger, Dennis Krusak has been sounding the alarm for a while. As an endangered species specialist with the U.S. Forest Service, he's had an up-close look at the devastating effects that human progress can have on the animal kingdom. Butterflies are in decline for three main reasons, habitat loss, pesticides, and climate change. And as the population becomes more urban, it doesn't matter what metropolitan area you live in, you are seeing habitat loss on a daily basis. We're taking down our green space, putting in the perfect lawn, and then we're coming behind it to maintain the lawn with all of our pesticides. And it's taking out all of the native insects, not just butterflies. Um, and then climate change is having an effect because it's, the insects are getting out of sync with the plant communities. It's important to know with all the habitat loss going on that there are some butterfly species that are narrow endemic, which basically means they've got a very small localized home range. And if we're losing all that habitat, if we take it out, they're on the way to extinction. There's nothing else we can do about it because they're not going to migrate to a new habitat. They are tied to those natural plant communities. But there's nothing that says you can't build new plant communities. That's exactly what Jackie Billwood did. Jackie knows plenty about the plight of pollinators because she's a wildlife biologist and professor, not to mention Dennis's wife. But it was one of her students that served as the impetus for the pollinator garden that she helped create on the campus at Georgia Highlands College. It all goes back to a day when a student came into my office with a hummingbird in her hand and she said she'd been walking across campus and literally this hummingbird basically just fell out of the sky, hit the pavement, she picked it up, and when I thought about it afterwards, I thought, I looked around campus and I said, we shouldn't really be surprised by this because our college campus is basically a very nice set of buildings in a sea of just manicured green lawn with no flowers at all for these animals to feed on. So I decided, um, after we'd had the hummingbird for about a week, that we needed to put a garden in. and. Uh, not just for hummingbirds, but also for butterflies, bees, and all the other pollinators that need a constant source of flowers, essentially from spring to fall, on which to feed. We started off with just three beds. They were four by eight. We bought some kits that we could use. Basically, they're just um, a kind of a plasticky material, and we made four by eight beds. They're about a foot deep, and that was our first year. It was so successful that the next year we more or less doubled the size of the, um, our little plot. The third year we put in some more beds to the point where we now have about 250 square feet. It's not a large garden at all, but the original plants are all there, including the ones that we've added every year. They just keep growing and growing and growing, and basically what we've done is we've created a little ecosystem in this sea of grass that has predators, it has prey, it has a variety of a great diversity of different insects, all of which essentially are part now of our little pollinator community. But it's always a work in progress and Jackie's pollinator garden at Georgia Highlands College is no exception. After just two years, they noticed that their garden bed kits that they bought at the box store were starting to deteriorate really badly. So they came up with a great solution that's also a wonderful idea for anybody that's challenged for space. These are called planter wall blocks, and you can find them at your home improvement center. They're made of precast concrete, and they have these recesses in the sides meant to accept basic two by six lumber. Use the blocks as your corners and drop in boards to create a raised bed of basically any size you want. If you want to go taller, you could stack the blocks and anchor them to the ground with a piece of rebar right through the center hole. And to really go green, you can use composite decking instead of real milled lumber. This stuff is made from 95% recycled materials like sawdust and plastic film. Cut it to length with regular power tools and you've got your raised pollinator bed ready to fill with soil and plants within 30 minutes. 
It's totally customizable to whatever size and shape you want. It'll last longer than a pre-bought kit and probably cost you less too. It's an easy way to put a pollinator garden almost anywhere and be enjoying butterflies almost instantly. You may see the occasional butterfly breeze through your yard and think to yourself, there's a butterfly, everything is great, my landscape must be doing its part. But are you really doing enough? Dennis says maybe not. It could be that your neighbor's garden is the one that's pollinator friendly, with the two things that butterflies need most, host plants and nectar plants. And whether you've got acres of farmland, a suburban backyard, or even a condo in the city, it's an easy thing to add the right blooming plants that will aid in butterfly conservation. In other words, don't just leave it up to your neighbor. If you want to attract butterflies to your garden, the first thing I would do is eliminate pesticides if you're using pesticides. But if you can't eliminate them, at least minimize the pesticides because the pesticide you put down is not species specific and it will kill everything in your yard. It doesn't matter whether it's your ladybugs or your lacewings that are eating the aphids and the thrips that are eating your flowers or the caterpillars or the butterflies you're trying to um, conserve. The pesticides will kill them, so eliminate the best you can pesticides. The next thing to do is consider what species do you want to attract? What is native to your area? And because you need to know what species you want to attract so you can plant the appropriate host plants. Host plants are the plants that the females will lay their eggs on and some species are host specific. Monarch butterfly females will only lay eggs on milkweed. The fritillaries are going to lay their eggs on passion vines. Zebra swallowtails are going for pawpaws, so you need to know what's native to your area and decide what you want to garden for and get those host plants in the ground. If you're like me, you can never seem to have enough plants in your garden to attract butterflies and other pollinators. And while we all have a wide variety of general options for food sources, from the often overlooked but highly beneficial oak tree, to a number of shrubs and countless perennials and annuals, we can all do more to help. Typically, the most widely available plants we can buy are good general options, but the most important plants we can add for attracting and helping the butterfly population is to provide more host-specific native plants that provide food and nesting sites for specialist butterflies. They're the ones that rely on a single type of plant for food and habitat, like what milkweed is for monarchs. But the problem often begins for homeowners when we're unsure of what plants to buy that are best for whatever butterflies we're trying to attract. Now some quick online research can help with that. But once we know, it can be quite the challenge to find exactly what we're looking for at garden centers. While they typically carry the most popular general pollinator friendly plants, that doesn't solve the problem of finding those host specific plants. Fortunately, there are more nurseries around the country that are starting to provide native plants that are also host specific for the butterflies that would be found in your area. And to help with that, there are companies that were created to identify, grow, and provide native plants specifically selected for each region that are the best choices for butterflies and pollinators, including host specific plants. So the next best thing after doing your homework, always my first choice, is to make friends with a knowledgeable, trusted expert or garden professional or look for branded plants selected as pollinator friendly at your independent garden center or online. It's just one more way to take the guesswork out of gardening. For more information and links about what plants you should be growing in your garden to help attract and protect butterflies, be sure to check out our website under the show notes for this episode. The migration of the monarch butterfly. It's an incredible phenomenon within the animal world. The monarch is the only butterfly that makes a trip south for the winter and back again in spring, just like birds. During their journey, most monarchs log 50 to 100 miles of flight in a single day, and some go as far as 3,000 miles in one trip. Since the monarch moment she had in the Pennsylvania countryside and without any formal training or expertise, Kylie has become a self-taught expert even writing a book on the subject. And she's made it her mission to educate others on what makes the monarch so unique 
and so uniquely important to our environment. Everything, everything about them fascinates me. From the very tiny egg that's the size of a grain of sugar, and that a little tiny caterpillar comes out of that, turns right around, eats its egg case for its very first meal, then it goes to the milkweed, which by the way is the only plant that a monarch can raise its young on. That's the only thing they eat. But once you get to the end of the summer, the monarchs that come out at the end of August through September and through fall are the ones that are going to migrate. Once they're adults, they don't really make use of milkweed. By that time in, in the year, the milkweed's not blooming, so they don't even really use the nectar from the milkweed plant. They don't eat it. They need the nectar from plants like goldenrod, asters, joe pieweed, annuals like zinnias. Anything that has nectar late in the season is very, very important to them because as they travel from the lower part of Canada all the way to Mexico, they have to fatten up. They have to get their reserves so that they can keep going. So all along that flyway between Canada and Mexico, they need to be able to find nectar from these plants. So just as important as the milkweed are these late season blooming plants that have nectar to fuel them on their way. Because the monarchs that go to Texas, through Texas into Mexico, are the ones that are going to be the basis for the population for the following year. And the monarchs that start out in Canada and the United States that funnel down through Texas into Mexico will stay the winter in the Oyamel fir forest there in the Sierra Madre Mountains. And they're in diapause, they're in a state of diapause while they're there. They don't sexually mature when they come out in Canada and the U.S. They have one mission and that is to get to Mexico. While they're down there, they cluster on these trees in a very protected, very specific protected environment. That's a miracle in itself because they've never been there before. But they go there. They go to the exact same place every year. How they know where to go, how they find this place, not ever having been there, is still part of the mystery. But once in the spring that it starts to warm up, then they come out of diapause, they will mate, and then they will start their trek northward. They get to where they find milkweed, which they know they need for their young, and they will lay eggs. Then they die. Then those eggs, when they hatch and mature, they will continue to fly northward following the milkweed. They will only go as far as milkweed grows. That's the farthest north that they'll go. And that, Kylie says, is where those of us who live anywhere along that all-important flyway between Mexico and Canada can get involved in saving this majestic species. There are things that you can do, even if you're not a gardener. Of course we know, plant milkweed, plant the, the nectar plants for late in the season. But you can also support organizations that are supporting the monarchs. Monetarily, you can do volunteer work. Community gardens, put a, suggest to your community that you put in a, a habitat garden. If you help the monarchs, you're gonna be helping all the pollinators. So it's not just monarch specific. Yes, they're gonna benefit but all pollinators are going to benefit from anything that you do for the monarchs. Kim Pegram is an insect ecologist and butterfly specialist at the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix. She's also leading the charge in educating the public about ways to get in touch with monarchs and ensure their survival through pollinator planting in their own yards. The Greater Phoenix area is a huge expanse of land, and if you think about a butterfly that's trying to cross that area, we want to provide what we call habitat stepping stones. If you think about the city like a pond, they need these little spots uh, that provide the nectar plants, that provide the milkweed that they need. So anybody can become a Monarch Way Station. So it's a certification you get through another organization called Monarch Watch. Um, and what it does, it's certification that you have provided everything that a monarch needs. You can even get uh, a little sign from Monarch Watch that tells your friends and neighbors that you're providing all these resources for monarch butterflies. 
But there's another way you can get involved, and it's even more hands-on. In addition to planting a garden for monarchs, something else that anybody can participate in is monarch tagging. Um, tagging is a citizen science program um, that allows people when monarchs arrive in their backyard to place a tag on the monarch and we can track where it goes in the migration. The tag is just a little sticker, goes on the outside of the wing. It doesn't hurt the butterfly, doesn't affect their ability to fly and it has an identification number and an email address on it. There are um, people in the overwintering sites in Mexico and California looking for monarchs with tags on them. So what happens is if a monarch comes to your backyard and you have your set of tags that you've gotten um, from one of the organizations, um, you put the tag on the outside of the wing and you tell the organization you got the tags from, the identification number, when you tagged it, uh, what it was doing, and then you let it go. Hopefully they find it, and now we know where it started and where it ended up. Not only are people in uh, Mexico and California and these overwintering sites looking for tags, anybody can also spot a monarch tag. If you have a monarch that shows up in your backyard and you see this little, it's usually a, a white tag that's on the outside of the, the wing, take a quick photograph of it, try to get a good look at it, get that identification number, get that email address, and email them to say you found this monarch in this location. And that again helps to find the migration routes, to find out where they're starting and where they're, where they're ending up, where they're traveling through. Educational programs from nature centers, books, even tagging programs from citizen scientists are all making a big difference. But nothing connects us more to nature than watching that complete life cycle of a butterfly right before our eyes. And if you have young children, it can be one of those moments that changes everything and something they'll probably never forget. And that's exactly what happened with one of our Growing a Greener World viewers, Krista Ferguson, in a video that she shared with us from her family. Hi, Growing a Greener World. My name is Krista, and these are my girls. And we have had the best time raising monarch butterflies this season. It all started with the butterfly garden at my daughter's school. And then I learned that we could do the same thing in our own backyard. We had a few nectar plants already, so all we needed was milkweed. We went to our local nursery and picked up a few plants, and then it didn't take long for the monarchs to find us and start laying their eggs. Once we found the eggs on our milkweed plants, we simply moved them into an enclosure so that we could protect them from predators and watch the whole process firsthand. While the entire metamorphosis is really incredible, my favorite part is when the butterflies first emerge and their wings are wet and they sway ever so gently back and forth, allowing their wings to dry before they take flight. It is truly serene. What's been your favorite part? My favorite part was watching the caterpillars turn into crystals. That was really amazing for me. It really was. They would hang in a jay for a day or two, wouldn't they? And then, boom, it would happen really fast. What's been your favorite part? My favorite part has been watching the caterpillars eat and grow. They sure do eat a lot, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> now that I've become a bit of a monarch mama, I plan to do this for many years to come. It's just been so simple and rewarding. Thank you so much for allowing us to share our monarch butterfly journey with you. Maybe you've never given butterflies much thought before, except when one floats past you in the garden. But butterflies play a huge role in the larger ecosystem at work all around us. And right now, some of them are struggling. We hope today's episode gave you greater insight into the importance of protecting these pollinators and why it's up to all of us to make that happen. Be more proactive, become a citizen scientist, or at the very least, install some native plants that attract more butterflies and pollinators. And wherever you can, promote healthier habitats. You can end up saving a lot more than a butterfly or two. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Joe Lample, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.